Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Hebrews 9, 27. This morning, every single one of us are interested in payday. Whether you're making 100,000 pounds per year, and if that's you, I want to be your friend. Whether you're waiting patiently for your pension to come through or some investment you've made to begin to pay dividends, or even if you're simply earning 100 pounds a week, every single one of us are interested in payday. We, we, we look forward to what we have earned. As far as we're concerned, we deserve it. And it is a law of life. And that is if somebody works for somebody else, we are supposed to get payment for that work. And that law of payment applies also to the spiritual realm. Because I want to let you know right now, God pays off. And he pays in two ways. Number one, if you sin, he pays a judgment. But number two, if you serve him, he pays a reward. Now, I want to preach this morning a sermon I simply call Payday. And I want us to see an important dynamic, uh, but also a very important lesson that would help us understand uh, 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 this issue of divine payment. Amen. Let's read Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Then we're going to jump to Hebrews chapter 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Verse 8. For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will reap of the spirit everlasting life. Now let's jump to Hebrews. Hebrews 9.27. Very well-known text. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Can we pray this morning and ask God to help us? Amen. Father, we love you. Lord, we are grateful for the assembly. We are grateful for this day. We are grateful for all you are doing in our lives. Even the rain, God, we are grateful. God, for it is a sign of blessing in your word. And I'm asking God right now, you will speak to every man that is, and woman here that is gathered in this service. I'm praying, God, they would not leave here the same way they came. I'm praying, Lord, as you have placed eternity in their hearts. Father, I pray, begin to awaken that. Begin to speak to them regarding that. Begin to deal with that element in them. God, even those who are watching right now online, I'm asking God, eternity. God will become real. God will begin be, become a driving force uh, to their lives, to their choices and decisions. God, remember, Lord, our frame. And God, I'm asking you would help us to do that which is right in the time you've given us uh, to do it. Father, we want to give you the glory. We want to give you the praise. We come against all distractions, especially in this time. Mighty God, let us give you our undivided attention, God. As we've sang, open the eyes of our hearts. Lord, do so this morning. We give you the glory. We give you the praise in Jesus' wonderful name. And all God's people said, uh, amen and amen. I want to look, first of all, this morning at the two fields of life. The two fields of life. Now, the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews are contrasting books. And what I mean that that by that they are contrasting books, in them you will see several uh, contrastings uh, taking place. Now, let me say this. The Bible really is a book of contrast. There is so much different contrast in the word of God. When you read, amen, in the Bible, you see straight away from the book of Genesis chapter 4, you see a contrast in families, in the family of Cain. Here is Cain, he comes into the world, and from Cain, there are men that are born uh, where there, there is violence uh, and there is polygamy. In four chapters, you see a people, uh, they are celebrating bloodshed and they are flouting God's uh, design for marriage. Uh, and in contrast to this, uh, we see Abel, uh, uh, from him we see Seth, uh, and Seth, the moment Seth is born, the Bible says that uh, men from that time began, uh, 
uh, to worship God again. They began to focus on God again. They began to give glory to God again. So you see the contrast, the men of the family of Cain, uh, and you see the contrast of the family of Seth. Uh, you see where there is one, there is violence, uh, amen, and there is just immorality. And you see one of worship uh, and adoration to God, but also you see a contrast uh, of hospitality. The Bible tells us uh, how angels came to Abraham um, and they came, uh, and as they came into his presence, uh, uh, they, they were like men and they came into his presence straight away. Abraham uh, ran to the angels, uh, began to be hospita uh, hospitable to them, uh, uh, takes them into his tent, uh, tells Sarah, could you please make something uh, for these men? Because in the Eastern time, during those times, uh, and even today, uh, hospitality is an important thing. You, 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 you have to be hospitable. You have to show uh, 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 care to strangers. Uh, and here these angels, they're ushered into his house and he begins to feed them. He begins to uh, uh, help them. He begins to serve them. And he just wants to be a blessing and, he, and he's trying to just be hospitable. Uh, but you see the contrast with those same angels, uh, they go um, and then into Sodom. No longer do we see hospitable, we see hostility uh, towards these men. In the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews, we find Jewish believers who are going through a time of difficulty and feeling the pressure of that difficulty. They have left Judaism and they are uh, become Christians, but they are feeling the pressures of being Christians and they're thinking, should I go back to Judaism? And church, when any, whenever you and I are under pressure, we can easily revert back to what we know. We can easily revert back to what we left. And there were people, and these people are pointing out to them uh, that Christianity doesn't have some of the things that Judaism does, uh, that Christianity doesn't have a temple, Christianity doesn't have a man, uh, a tabernacle, Christianity doesn't have a high priest, uh, Christianity doesn't have an altar, Christianity doesn't have the, all these things. Uh, and uh, here it is, the writer begins to speak to them, uh, and he's writing to them, and he's saying, yes, Christianity doesn't have a temple, uh, Christianity doesn't have a tabernacle, uh, Christianity doesn't have an altar, Christianity doesn't have a priest for say it, but what Christianity has is Jesus. And church, how many know Jesus is better this morning? And he begins to speak to them about this as the writer, as their pastor, and he begins to bring a contrast between Jesus and all these things. Now, church, why do we contrast? When I had my, my, my tumor, I was having an MRI scan every six months. Then that changed to every year. And recently it's now become every two years, I have to go uh, to the hospital and get an MRI scan. And when I have an MRI scan, they didn't do this for everybody else, but they do it for some people, not all people. When I have an MRI scan, what happens is they inject a dye into my body. This dye is actually called a contrast agent. And the whole point of this contrast agent is to highlight, they're dealing with my brain here, is to highlight to, and to bring to attention anything that is out of place so they can focus in on it. The whole point of this contrast agent uh, is to bring clarity to things uh, that you and I will not be able to see. I mean, with a normal, um, you can say, uh, a scan or with the, even with a naked eye. And the whole point, amen, uh, of this is to give us a detailed look into the brain of Abdul Yusuf, to give us a detailed look to see if anything's changed, anything's different. You see, church, the whole point uh, of contrasting uh, is to is to, is to show is there a difference uh, and to bring the difference into our attention uh, so you and I, amen, if you're a doctor, to make an educated decision. Now, one of the things we need to focus on, one of the things we need to get a detailed look upon, one of the things this morning that we need clarity, that we need to get into our minds, is that our God is not going to be made a fool of. And here's what he says. You are going to reap what you sow. I love the old King James. God is not mocked. God says, don't take me for a fool. And I'm going to show you why you should take me for a fool. You're going to reap what you sow. In Galatians, there is a contrast, a difference we see between the flesh and the spirit. Church, these are two fields we all possess. And we see the results of sowing into any of these two fields in our lives. 
The Bible says if we sow to the fields of the flesh in Galatians, uh, 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 in Galatians, uh, the Bible says we bring uh, corruption. Uh, corruption uh, amen, is flesh at its most revolting state. I don't know if you've ever looked at meat that is rotten before. If you ever see meat, I mean, it just begins to go off and it begins to change color. And sometimes worms comes and it begins to stink. I mean, the flesh, I mean, uh, uh, when it begins to corrupt, uh, the Bible says, I mean, uh, when the flesh begins to walk, I mean, and function or invest in corruption, I mean, we are beginning to see its most revolting state. And at the end of that is death. But it says, if you sow to the spirit, you get everlasting life. There's something about everlasting life that just sounds right. There's something about everlasting life that just sounds fresh. That you use soul to the spirit of God. Amen. What you gain, amen, is life everlasting. In church, what we need to see is the flesh and the spirits are fields that we sow into. And what we see, we are given the spiritual, you can say MRI in Galatians 5, 19, 21. The Bible tells us when you sow to the flesh, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, uh, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, uh, 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 envy, murder, drunkenness, revileries, and, and the likes of which uh, I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you uh, in time past, uh, that those who practice such things uh, will not inherit uh, the kingdom uh, of God. Let me read you another version. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual morality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, uh, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I, I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you sow to the flesh, that's what you get. But you sow to the spirit now. You plant in that field. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says this, but the, field, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And I want you to remember that because that's so important today. See, this morning, this morning, church, every day, we have an opportunity to decide which field am I going to sow into? The flesh or the spirit? And this is how you know which one I'm sowing into the most. Whatever has been produced from your life is an indication of which field you're investing in the most. So I tell you right now, you cannot invest in your flesh and expect to gain spiritual blessings. We want to come here and pray and God, bless me, help me, help me, help me. But if you're invested in the flesh, if you live in a fleshy life, don't expect God to bless you. So whatever field we are sowing into church, we reap the benefits or the consequences of that field. And when it comes to reaping, there is a law, many of you know the law of the harvest. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap more than you sow. And this is what I want to focus on. You're going to reap after you sow. So let's consider payday's breakdown. Because it's very clear that men have sold to the flesh. It's very clear that men have sold to the flesh and to sin. Because everywhere we see the reaping of the consequences of that, and that's death. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul who sins shall die. Romans says, for the wages of sin is death. So the word of God teaches that God both sovereignly appoints both your birthday and your death day. Psalms 139 says in Psalms 139, 16, it says, in your book were all written the days that ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Think about that. 
in your book, God, you've written my life even when I didn't have life. Think about that. Listen, God knows your birthday and God knows your death day. Death may seem accidental to us, but it's never accident to God. And many people live like life, like death is going to have the last word over them, that, that, that somehow death is the end of all things. And the reason being is we want to fulfill all our desires uh, before I get to the end. You know what? Because you know what? Once I get to the end, that's it. I can't do it anymore. So let me just do all I need to do. Let me just, whatever your desire is, whatever floats your boat, whatever gets you excited. Let me go and get all those things done, you know, before, before, before I get to the end. Because once I get to the end, that's it. And let me, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the big things in our day and age is bucket lists. Who knows what a bucket list is? A bucket list is things you want to do before you die. You want to jump out of plane. You want to bungee jump. You want to go and slip. You want to go and swim with uh, uh, um, uh, 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 with sharks in a cage. Hopefully in a cage. You know, but people have all this. I'll have the, all these things. I've got my bucket list. I've got my bucket list. They want to go and visit this nation. And like, and I, I, it's, hey, you know, hey, you know, what, hey, whatever, whatever. But you know, here's my thing with a bucket list when it comes to Christians. To me, a bucket list. I'm not anti per se. But it kind of, it kind of, it kind of gives me. It, it, to me, it's an indication of what you really believe about what's coming. I had, I had an opportunity when we got married. We had an opportunity to go to Israel for our honeymoon, and I really wanted to go. And what happens? The, the fighting began to break out. There's always fights there, but it began to break out. So no, no, so I ain't going there. I gotta get killed. <laughs> So we didn't go, but in my mind, you know, you know, if we get to go, we get to go. But my, let me tell you how I feel about Israel right now. I'm going to see Israel regardless. Regardless. You see, I'm even going to see in this life. I'm not in a big hurry to go and see it. I'm even going to see in this life. I'm going to see it when I come back with Jesus. And when I come back with Jesus, it'll be far better then than it is now. So I'm going to see. So it's not, I'm, not, I'm okay. It's not a bucket. I have no bucket list. I really don't. You know, if you're not saved, I understand why you need a bucket list because this life is as good as it's going to get for you. You, you. you go, bro. You go, girl. Do that bucket list because after you die. So I get it for unsaved people. I really do. But saved people, why? Really? Don't, don't kill yourself over that. Don't, don't, don't. Because where we're going and what God has for us is far more greater. It's far more grander. You know, if it, if, it, if it happens, it happens. Praise God. But I'm not going to, I've got to do it if I die. I've got to do it. I've got to go. I've got to go. No, no. There's no need for that. No need for that. See, what we need to understand is death is not the end. Let me put it to you this way. Death is a transition. It's not a conclusion. And we are given three realities. The Bible says, in, in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die. This morning, I'm not trying to be morbid, but you're going to die. In fact, we're all going to die. Nobody escapes it. I don't care how, whether you exercise. I don't care if you're trying a new uh, 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 vitamins trial. And, and I, I don't care what, what you're eating. I don't care what you're injecting. You're going to die. The Bible says a point for man to die and it carries on once you're going to die once i don't know what people believe here because I, I don't live in your mind but let me help somebody there is no such thing as reincarnation doesn't it, it you, you're not going to you're not going to leave this world and come back as a better person or a different thing than you were before when you came you're going to live and die once then there is judgment this is where we reap what we sow this is where we 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 get amen the div, the div, you know we we get amen the investments uh, amen that we have invested uh, amen our our things in and this word judgment sadly it is used in a negative state when I did a study a word study on that very word judgment and I pulled up all the all the places where that same word judgment has come up in the Bible amen it is never positive. It's always negative. It's always, it's, ne listen to me, judgment is coming. It really is. And one thing that hits me is that we all are aware, if you're a child of God, there is a heaven 
and there's a hell. It's there, whether you like it or not, it's, it's there. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. He didn't speak more about heaven than hell. He spoke more about hell than he did about heaven because hell is a real place that he doesn't want anyone to go to. It is a horrid, horrid place. I was, spoken, I was speaking to a man uh, uh, who used to be a pastor and he was just telling me since he was saying pastor when I did my study on that I'm not a pastor anymore but I've, I've had time to be just go into the word of God and study about hell and it is a horrid place there is it, 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 it's like it, it's anything I see is bleak and it's dark and it's it, it, it could, couldn't it be somewhere else couldn't, couldn't, couldn't we just go in there for you know a thousand years and get back out and yes we are going to go for a thousand years come back out but we're going to go into a worse place after that So here's the thing I want you to see. Just as there are degrees of reward in heaven, there's degrees of punishment in hell. What do I mean? A regular guy is not going to get it as worse as Hitler. We're not all going to be in the same cell, per se. We're going to be the same prison. We don't all go to the same cell. Even in prison, there is a worse place called solitary confinement. That's horrible. At least in the cell, you got people you can be with, or you got more space, and and there's light and there's things. Like solitary confinement is horrid. I remember years ago when I did a crime, and I was thrown into a cell. And in that cell, this is West London. In that cell, they had a solitary confinement bit. I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm in the prison. I'm making noise. I'm shouting, being super stupid. Then they take me. And th this is when police officers were police officers. They, these guys now, they're not police officers. They took me and they threw me into solitary confinement there. It's true. They're not, you, this, it, the police officers now, lightweight. Lightweight. Absolutely lightweight. Useless. You know, <laughs> useless. Back then, listen, they'll put you in a van. The van will beat the, the snot out of you, right? And, and, and they put me in this solid... Listen, after 10 minutes, I was losing my mind. It's dark. It's, 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 it's constricted. I'm there. I'm trying to do it. I'm, all right, let me just do some... I'm doing the jumping jacks. I'm doing the, everything. And I, and I, okay, I said, hello, hello, hello. Let me out! There's a prison, hell, and there's a cell, and there's a solid confinement. And each one is bad, but several are worse. I'll say it again. Just as there are degrees of reward in heaven, there are degrees of punishment in hell. See, hell will be terrible by all accounts. It's going to be terrible because it is eternal. You are never going to ever get out. But hell, if I can use this word, will be fair. And again, I'll say it again. The average man will suffer, but not to the degree of Hitler. Now, this by no means minimizes the bleakness of hell. It doesn't at all. So while sin is sin, there are degrees of accountability when sins are committed. And I want to show this in scripture because it's very important to understand this. First one I want to give you is John chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus is before Pilate. Pilate's kind of throwing his weight around. Don't you know I have power to release you or to condemn you? And Jesus looks at Pilate in John 19, 11, it says, you have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, listen to this, the one who delivered me to you, that one being Judas, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And what Jesus is saying is Judas in his sin of unbelief, in his sin of betrayal, in a sin of rejecting Jesus Christ, had the greatest sin, had the greater judgment, is going to have the greater judgment than Pontius Pilate. See, men who receive greater light and fail to respond to it are more accountable to God. 
Judas has been with Christ. Judas has spent time with Christ. Judas has walked with Christ. Judas has seen the miracle of Christ. Pontius Pilate has not. And because of the light God has given you and what you did with it will determine the degree of judgment that God will meet out to you in eternity. See, what determines heaven and hell is simply what we do with Jesus Christ. Are we going to accept him as our Lord and our Savior? Or are we going to reject him, turn our backs to him? Are we going to be like Judas? Amen. Are we going to say, you know what? I don't need Jesus Christ in my life. But listen to me. But once an individual is confined into the lake of fire, the word of God says the degree of punishment will be based upon the light that individual received and also the sins that individual committed. So not all will be receiving the same judgment on judgment day. It's important we see this. Let's look a bit further in Luke chapter 12. Do a bit of reading, like I said, Luke chapter 12. We want to read from verse 42 to 48. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. So here's Jesus. Amen. You're a faithful servant. You, 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 you have been, you've, you've honored me. You've trusted my word. You've obeyed me. I'm going to hook you up right when I come. That's what he's saying. Now look at verse 45. But this is where we say, uh oh, if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him, and at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in two. First point, punishment. Bleak punishment. Cut him in two and appoint him uh, his portion with the unbelievers. Now, here's the second one. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. So we have somebody that's been cut in two. Now we have somebody that's been beaten with many stripes. Here's the next one. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For everyone to whom much is given, to him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, to him they will ask the more. So you have somebody who is cut in two. You have somebody who's beaten with many stripes, and you have somebody who's beaten with few stripes. And what we are seeing very clearly is a degree of judgment that God is trying to show us. Here is somebody who knew the will of God, but they rejected it in verse 42. And the Bible says they received many, many stripes. But in contrast, verse 48, amen, we see somebody who knew, amen, who did not know, and they received few stripes. Again, the basis of judgment is light received and sins committed. God has revealed. God has has shown, God has made himself known to you, amen, you've walked with him maybe in a, a period of time, amen, you've known, amen, about God, amen, but also in that, amen, there's things that you've done within that period you should not have done, and God says, when I put it together, it will determine what you get. Another one is Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 21. This is Jesus' condemnation over the cities where most of his mighty works were done. The Bible says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works were done, had been done because they did not repent. He says, woe to Chorazim, woe to Bethsaida, 
For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And what he's saying is Tyre and Sidon, I mean, were only exposed to very, very uh, uh, little, uh, little light. And he says they would have repented. This city would have repented, uh, amen, if they received the light that you received. This city would have got right if they saw what you saw. This city amen, would have served me, amen, if they had the opportunity that you had. Again, I'll say again church uh, amen uh, to whom much has been given much will be required verse 22 he says these words but i say to you it will be more tor tolerable for time and sidon in the day of judgment than for you you're getting judged but it could be more tolerable for them you're getting it but it's gonna be, it's gonna, there's going to be some form of leniency on them. And I'll say this, the city suffering in hell is the inhabitants, the citizens who witness the miracles of Christ, but they refuse. It's not talking about the whole city. It's not like it's staying in the whole of Tottenham, but the people who saw some things. Lastly, this one I want to see, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead this is speaking about the great white throne judgment. And I saw the dead and small and great stand before God. And the books, plural, were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books that were open according to their works. Listen, the basis of the degree of judgment in hell comes down to this, according to their works. What you and I get in heaven, the rewards will come down to your works. What people will get in hell will come down to their works. So the white throne judgment is from everyone from Cain all the way down to the millennium when Jesus comes and judges the, judges the world. All the way down that then. Every, every unbeliever, every, every person who had rejected Christ as Savior is going to be at the white throne uh, of judgment. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the Bible tells us uh, that condemnation will come down to the works. But the degree of punishment that's going to be given out happens there. And the Bible says the books were open. So what books? I want, I, want, I want to throw out three books that I believe is going to happen in that day. Number one is the book of life. We're told very clearly that one of the books that was open was the book of life. In the book of life is this. Were you saved? Did you give your life to Christ? Because church, let me make it very simple. If, you were not, if you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. It's really that simple. And the book of life, we either have your name in it or not. And if your name is not, it doesn't matter how many times you visit the church. It doesn't matter how good you are in your heart. If your name is not in God's book, you are not making heaven your home. It is really that simple. I also believe there will be the book of the law. Listen, if you refuse Christ, Christ is the, the Bible says the grace of God has appeared before men. If you refuse Christ, you're refusing the grace of God. And if you refuse the grace of God, that means you have to be judged by the law of God. The law of God is God's righteousness. The law of God, amen, it, it reflects, amen, the standards of God's word, amen, it is his righteousness. And the Bible lets us know, church, if we are saved and forgiven, amen, that Christ is the end of the law. Because he fulfilled the law, church, because he fulfilled it to the T, amen, that lets me know that this morning, that because Christ has done what I could not do, what you and I could not do this morning, church, you and I are redeemed from the law, we are redeemed from the curse of the law, we don't have to fulfill it because he's done it, and because we put our faith in him, church, amen, we make heaven our home. The last one is the book of the deeds of men. Church, God is keeping a track of all the unrighteous deeds of the unsaved and the good works of the saved. 
Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. They say the UK is the most CCTV country in the world. That they have, they have, they, there's almost no, way, no, no place you can go without some, some camera catching you. The reality is they can catch so many criminals, but that's not what the cameras are there for yet. That's just the truth. There's so many things they see, but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, that's, that's not what the cameras are there for. But here's the thing. God's eyes sees everywhere. There's nothing that God does not see. There's nothing you don't do that his eyes are closed to. He sees it all, everything. Now you say, why does God see everything? Number one, it is because it's going to determine the basis of judgment God's going to meet out in, in, in judgment day. What he sees, you do. It's going to determine what I'm going to bring judgment in, but also for those who are right before God, it's going to determine what I bring reward in. But also, God's eye sees it all because God wants you to know he's paying attention. Listen, you can't trick God. God's not naive. God's not stupid. God sees everything. He knows it all. And because God pays attention, church, we are going to absolutely, without fail, for good or for bad, we are going to all reap what we sow. And I make a statement this morning, church, hell will be pleasurable for no unbeliever. No person who is not right with God will find hell a pleasurable or comfortable place. In fact, the most moral of sinners, you know, you meet people, some people, they're, so, they're nice people. Like, man, you're nice, man. God, you're better than me. And I'm sick. You're, you're better. That person is going to have a horrible hell. I want to close with the last words. Because church, there's a harvest coming to all of us. Every person in this room, every person outside this building, there's a harvest coming. And the bottom line is the onus is on us what we reap. And I want to leave you with two things I'm going to pray. Number one, if you are saved, if you're right with God, the Bible says don't get tired doing good. Don't stop. Don't, don't, don't throw in the towel doing good. Listen, church, we decide what we reap. God only sits back and makes sure, amen, we reap what we sow. And the Bible is telling us, uh, amen, Paul finishes and says, uh, do not be wary in well-doing because you shall reap if you faint not. In other words, keep on doing good. Payday is coming. God's going to help you. God's going to bless you. God's going to come through for you. It's coming. Just keep on. Don't throw in the towel. Because the opposite of good is what bad. There ain't no in between. God says, just keep on doing good. Your payday is coming. Just as, amen, you work a job, and you know, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, amen, you're going to get paid. God says, don't worry, I've got you. Just keep on doing good. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labors is not in vain in the Lord. That whatever you are doing for God is not in vain. Just keep on doing it. The second thing is this, Jesus is coming. We all know verse 27 of Hebrews is appointed for man to die once, then judgment. But many times we, we don't know verse 28 or we fail to read verse 28. Verse 28 says this. So let's, let's work together. It's appointed for man to die once in judgment. Verse 28 says this. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. It's a point for man to die once in judgment. So, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. The picture of this is of the day of atonement 
every year the high priest would take blood and he would go into the holies of holies. As he enters into the holies of holies, he would, he would be, first of all, in the sight of the people. Then all of a sudden, as he enters in, all of a sudden, he's no longer in sight. In other words, they cannot see him. He's, he's behind this thick veil that is a picture of the sins of man. And he's going there to make atonement for their sins. And what should basically take a few minutes would have seemed like hours. Because if you know anything about the high priest, when he went into the holies of holies, he would have bells on his ankles and, he, and, and, and they would tie a cord around it. Because you go in there not right, God says, I'm going to kill you. And nobody wants to go in there. So if they don't hear the bells ringing anymore, oh gosh, him dead. So they begin to pull him out. They're like, next. So as he goes in there, everyone's panicking because he's our high priest. He has to make atonement for us. If this man doesn't come out, that means atonement has not been made. That means God's not pleased. That means we're finished. So they all, you know, is this, this really just a you know, sprinkle the blood, you know, just a couple of minutes and he's back out. Not, and I'll tell you something, it's gonna, it would have felt like an eternity. But listen, the moment he came out, there was jubilation. There was excitement. It's like, yes! Him coming out means God has accepted our sacrifice. Him coming out means God, amen, is pleased with us. Him coming out, amen, means God, things are okay with us and God. Here's the problem. We've got to wait for next year again. The Bible says our high priest now has gone in once and for all. He doesn't need to go in, out, in, out, check it all about, do the hokey hokey, turn it over around. No, no, he's gone in once. And the Bible says, listen, right now, it may seem like he's out of sight because it's been 2,000 years. But church, how many know, man, he's coming again? And when he comes, there's going to be celebration. There's going to be jubilation. There's going to be excitement. God's church is going to say, yes. And when we say, yes, it's going to be such an excitement, we'll be taken to heaven. See, when Christ comes back, let me tell you something, two things. It is an indication that God is satisfied with what he did on the cross. It is the ultimate indication of that. But here's the second thing as well. He says he's not coming back to deal with sin because he's already done so already, once for all. He's coming back to take us home. Listen, he's coming again. We need to be excited. We, we, we need, that's why the Bible calls it the blessed hope that we are looking for it. We are literally looking for it. That we're at any moment now, is this it? Can it have, and you're looking, you're seeing, looking at world affairs and things happening in the world. And, it, and there's a looking, there's a sense of ex expectation. At any moment now, he's going to come. And here's this high priest. He had to go through a tabernacle. Listen, Christ has gone to heaven, out of sight. But at any moment, he's going to come. And this is what I love, and I want to close with this in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Here's the words of Christ. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. I love this. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to their work. What is the work we do for God, church? I mean, good works is what we do for God. Good deeds are what we do for men. And I want to encourage you as the writer, amen, of Galatians, as Paul says, do not be wary in doing good for God. Because in due season, you will reap if you don't faint. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Amen. Every head bowed. Every eyes closed. Amen. Thank God. As a Christian, I rejoice that payday is coming. As a Christian, I rejoice that God has my reward. But maybe you're here this morning and you're not right with God. In other words, Jesus Christ is not your Lord and your Savior. Friend, it's not just something you speak, it's something you live. If Christ is not your Lord and your Savior, then one day you're going to appear at the great white throne of judgment. This is a horrid place. This is a place where judgment is meted out judgment is given out My friend I'll say it again whether it is cut into many pieces or whether it's beaten with many stripes or whether it's beaten with few either way it's not good 
there is no respite there's no real consolation I'm just making those points to let you know that God is fair but eternity is eternity and separation from God is separation from God and God forbid you appear at that throne and stand before the one who died for you but you reject it oh the Bible says he will judge all things which you know of can I throw in as well there's things you've done you don't even know you've done it you've just forgotten about it but he hasn't there's things you've involved yourself in and you've you've put it in the back of your mind and you've deleted it or you've you've just thrown away just things I don't know nothing hey, listen God knows and he sees everything his eyes are on the good are on the bad this morning the Bible makes it very clear that God is not willing that any should perish but all to come to repentance God is not rubbing his hands in eternity saying I can't wait to judge them no God amen sent his son Jesus because he can't wait to save you but you need to turn away from your sins and put your faith in him this morning I cannot emphasize how much God loves you But you need to accept Christ before it's too late. Under the sound of my voice right now, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I have not given my life to Jesus Christ. I have not made peace with God. And this morning, I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't want to die and end up in a devil's hell for all eternity. I want to spend forever with Jesus. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to give my life to Christ. Just do one thing. Just lift your hand up and put it down don't be shy don't be embarrassed friend I cannot emphasize how important this is one thing I tell people on the streets hell is too much of a long time to regret eternity is too much of a long time I could have I should have the people in this place God has given you light more light than many people will ever get what are you doing with that light he's revealed his word he's revealed himself are you going to continue to ignore him? Are you going to continue to reject him? Are you going to continue to play games with him? Slip your hand up. Raise my hand. I want to pray. I want, my, I want to give my life to Jesus. Don't be embarrassed. He loves you. Or maybe you've backslid. You're away from God. You were once saved. You, were once, you once lifted your hand. You came. You prayed. You began to live for God. But then you began to make decisions. Decisions determine destiny. And they've taken you away from God. But friend, if you make a decision to receive Christ again, you can get back into your walk, get back into the destiny that God has for your life. While there's breath for you, there's still a time, please. Come on, God is speaking to you. Hey, you've backslid. You want to recommit your life. Lift your hand up. Lift it up. Raise my hand. Amen. I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Listen to me. You're going to reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. Don't think because you got away with this world. No, 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 no. You will reap what you sow. You're going to reap more than you saw. That's why hell is for eternity. And you're going to reap after. Or well, we may think we're okay now. But judgment day is going to reveal it all. Judgment day is going to reveal what you've been investing your life in. You're going to get what you've invested in at judgment day quickly anyone in this place final time join this honest hand you're not right with God or you've backslid lift your hand up here's my hand I want to pray I want to give my life to Christ here's my hand I want to recommit my life to Christ I don't want to play games with my soul you've only got one soul Jesus what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul lift your hand up and put it down quickly up and down up and down amen hallelujah my sister look at me do you mean it this morning I want you to come 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 amen I need one of the sisters from church we're going to pray about sister this morning.